Reach Young Adult Ministry Sermons online from Tuesday, October 20th, 2020 by Philip Jackson, pastor to young adults at Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, from the series Fear Factor, entitled Fear and Failure from the Gospel of John. Um, Tonight we're going to look at failure. Um, And one of the things about failure that is... It's intriguing is that um, we, we don't ever actually say this out loud, but in our, in our walk with God, we, we're more than happy to accept the salvation piece because that's free and that's fun. But we fall into the, the, the temptation of thinking that somehow, okay, now I've been saved. So now, now that God's taking care of the big stuff, now I can actually contribute to this. And so we begin to build this idea that somehow God needs me. He needs us to do what he wants us wants to accomplish in the world. But the truth is that what we've been offered is just a, a relationship. A relationship with God that he has expectations for us. And what we try to do is we try to add value. We think, oh, well, of course, yeah, God, you need me. So I'm awesome. Right? I love the analogy that I love these demotivational posters. They were a big thing when I was in high school. They're probably not a big thing anymore. But my favorite was a picture of a snowflake. And it said, remember, you're unique just like everyone else. So we've got to remember that when it comes to our relationship with God, fear is driven by this idea that, that it's, it's connected to our perceived value, right? So fear, the root of fear is actually pride. The idea that I'm important. And I don't know about you, but I grew up hearing from my parents, oh, you're special. God's going to use you someday. This is going to be awesome. He's got great things planned for you. Um, and then I got into my early 20s and I began to make mistakes and I began to realize that, wow, I'm not that awesome. And all of a sudden I need Jesus. So we're going to look at that tonight about what does God's word say about fear? So turn with me. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn over to John chapter 13. So we're going we're to look at three specific uh, events of the life of Jesus and his boy, Peter. I don't know if you know a whole lot about Peter, but I'll tell you kind of the setting of of this first incident. So Jesus has just finished the Lord's Supper. They have just he's just washed the disciples feet. So back in that time in history, um, there were no there was no modern transportation. Obviously, people walked everywhere. And so a common thing was for the slave of whoever whoever's home you walked into. They would wash your feet because you would typically be wearing sandals. And so what would happen is the slave would wash all the crap off of your feet. Literally, because you're walking in the street where animals have been. And so the slave would wash your feet in order for you to be clean enough to walk into the house. And so Jesus, in an act of service, what he does is he washes the disciples' feet after the Lord's Supper. And this is significant for a couple of reasons. The first is that he, he washes the feet of all of the disciples, all 12, including Judas. The one that he knows at that moment in time is actually being possessed by the devil. So you can imagine Jesus on his hands and knees washing the feet of the devil and looking up and seeing Judas's face, knowing that in a few hours he was going to betray him. And yet he does this as an expression of love. Okay, so he washes their feet and he tells them that the greatest among them is going to be the servant. And then he turns to Judas. So they're having dinner, right? He washes their feet and he tells them that one of you is going to betray me. And they're all, they all start whispering back and forth like, who is it? Who's it going to be? Who's, who, what's going to happen? And so he says, one of you is going to betray me. And I guess nobody was like picking up on these hints because uh, in the account of John, like they had no clue what was going on. They're like, who is it? I don't know. And then he tells, he tells Judas, he says, hey, why don't you go take care of the thing that you need to do? And Judas gets up and leaves. He's the only guy that leaves. And yet they have no clue what's about to happen. Like, <laughs> come on. I've seen this movie. Like, it's not that odd. It's not that, it's not that big of a deal. Right. Um, and so Judas gets up and leaves. And so then they have this little dialogue back and forth. And Peter, who's like this overzealous, like, you know, he's the passionate one of the group. Nobody's going to love more than Peter and nobody's going to fail more than Peter. He's just as that guy. He says, oh, no, Lord, I'm never going to I'm never going to betray you. I'm never going to never going to leave your side. I'm here for the long haul. Right. And after a brief, discu- brief discussion, Jesus is like, nobody. It's not how this is going to work. So join me if if you would look at, we're going to look at John chapter 13. We're going to start with 
The default setting. Repeat after me. I will fail. I will fail. It's a guarantee. Okay? It's a guarantee I'm going to fail. So Jesus, he, so we're going to start here. We're going to start out with just like the expectation. Okay? When you think about your life and your relationship with God and your relationship with the people around you, I hate to break it to you, but you will fail. No matter how smart you think you are, no matter how good looking you think you are, no matter how insignificant you think you are, big or small in God's kingdom, you will fail. 100% guarantee. So Jesus is talking to them after, the, after he tells Judas to leave. So let's pick this up. We're going to start in verse 31, and we're going to read, um, we're going to, read to, to 14, verse 7. Okay, so check this out. He says, when he had left, he's talking about Jesus, when, when, when he had left, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Children, I am with you a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Lord, Simon Peter said to him, well, I can just imagine, he's, he's protesting. Okay, Lord, verse 36, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Lord, okay, Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus replied, you will lay down your life for me. Truly, I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Notice Jesus doesn't actually rebuke him and say, oh, no, you're not going to you're not going to give your life for me. He acknowledges he's like, oh, you're going to die. But not before you deny me three times. But Jesus, I love Jesus because he always follows up with love. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14. He knows this hurts Peter's feelings. And he says, hey, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. So that where I am, you may be also. You know the way where I'm going. Lord, Thomas said, this is doubting Thomas. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I love Thomas too because Thomas is like the eternal skeptic. He's like always asking questions like, are you sure about this thing? When Jesus is risen from the dead and everybody's talking about how he has appeared to them, Thomas is the one who's like, okay, y'all are crazy. <laughs> he's, this, he's that guy that's never satisfied with any, any answer that you give him. So we start with this prediction of failure. So let's back up. Let's back up to verse 31. Okay, so he starts off by Jesus frames all of this. He says, this is all about the glory of God. Okay, verse 31 and 32 says, when he had left them, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, he's talking about, him, he's talking about Jesus. If God's glorified in me is what he's saying. God will also, also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. What he's saying is that Jesus is gonna, he's left us here to prepare the overarching glory of what God's wanting to accomplish. Okay, Jesus is saying, I'm about to leave, everybody. And I'm doing this for the glory of God. So think about this question. You probably have heard this before. Well, if, if I could just see Jesus, if I could just talk to him, like face to face, if we could just have like 30 minutes together, like I would believe. I would have, I would have no doubt in my mind. But what is Jesus saying? He's saying, I'm leaving because God is going to get the greater glory. Think about that in your life. That uncertainty that you deal with, that fear of failure. Jesus has created distance so that God can get more glory. Think about that as you walk with him, as you trust him, as you grow in your faith. This is a big deal. He's saying, you pursuing me 
is going to give God glory. And also, the thing about it is that Romans tells us that we share in the glory of Christ as co-heirs of the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying, look, this is not because I just want you to suffer. I'm doing this because this is, this is actually the way that, that God intended it. See, the challenges that are in front of us are there so that we can face them as God intended. Look at verse 33. He says, I'm leaving you. Verse 33 says, children, I am with you a little while longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you where I'm going, you cannot come. We have to accept the fact that God has separated us from from him on purpose. Right. We can't we can't sit there and have this mindset. Oh, well, you know what? When I'm in heaven, everything's going to be fine. You know what? When everything is all settled and good, I'm not going to have to worry about all this stuff. I'll focus on my faith then. Consider this. The thing that makes heaven so amazing, the thing that makes it heaven, is a relationship with God. Unfiltered, unchallenged, undistracted relationship with God. And if that's true, if God is the prize of heaven, then that means that heaven starts for us right now. It's not something that's like way in the future, like, okay, well, one day this is going to make sense to me and it's all going to be relevant. It's like the Olaf song, all this makes sense when I'm older, right? That's not how this works. I love that song. I don't know why, but it's just my, it's one of my favorites. Girl dad here. I'm not, I don't care. Um, but he's done this on purpose, right? So he's separated from us. He says, I'm leaving you. And as we face the challenges that we're going to fail at, God's teaching us how to love him like he loves us. So, I mean, everybody in this room walked in here, right? When you were learning to walk, Did you fall down? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because we all do that. But but as your parents were helping you learn to walk, did they just like trash you whenever you fell down? Like, (laughs) what's the matter with you? You are so worthless. It's not that hard. See, I'm doing it. (laughs) that's That's not what the Lord does. He's like, hey, we're learning to walk with him. Baby steps. Okay, and then he begins to teach us how to walk a little faster than to run. Okay, Jesus is saying this process as we as we face these challenges in our lives, God is teaching us to walk with him. And are we going to fail? Absolutely. Are we going to fall on our butts? Absolutely. But just like Jesus' response to Peter, he says, hey, don't let your heart be troubled. This is a conscious choice. But as children of God, what we do is when we fall, we sit there and we kick ourselves and think, I am so bad at this. And what does God say? Yeah, you are, but I love you. And I'm going to give you grace. Because like Paul says, his grace is sufficient for me. But he gives more grace. I love that phrase. Okay, so he does this so that we can learn what it's like to be living sacrifices. Our, Our theme this year for, for reach is the year of transformation. This process of failure over and over and over again is the process of being transformed. And the thing about being a living sacrifice is that we have to make the conscious decision to get back up every time we screw up. We can't be afraid of the failure because the fail- failure is a guarantee. What we really should be afraid of is not getting back up. Back up. Mm-hmm. He's saying this is important. See, but look, look at this. This is about our community, okay? Our community is the most obvious way that God's love is seen by others. Look at verses 34 and 35. So he's saying, hey, I'm going to go away. This is for God's glory. Look at verse 34. He says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Notice how many times did he say love one another? A lot. A lot. Because let's be honest, love is work, y'all. It sucks sometimes when you have to have a hard conversation with a friend. And you've got to make that relationship right. He says, this is how people are going to know you're different. Because you actually care about people. People aren't disposable in your life. Our world is full of people who are saying, oh, if you're in this group, you belong, you belong to us. If you're in that group, you're the enemy and we hate you, okay? We don't want anything to do with you. But the truth is that the thing that makes us different about being children of God is that when people see us and how we love one another, it changes things. 
God has given us three things to help us in our life separated from Jesus. The first is the Holy Spirit, right? He gives us the Holy Spirit. And later on in, this, in, this, uh, in the book of John, in the account of John, in chapters, chapters 16 and 17, Jesus says that I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you a helper. This is the Holy Spirit. He's going to teach you all things. He said, I would love to te- tell you everything, but you can't handle it right now. It's going to be a process. So I'm going to send you a tutor. It's going to help you understand this. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God's word. Second Timothy says that God's word is, is able to do anything. It is profitable for instruction, for correction, for reproof. That means dealing with, with, with trouble with others and for instruction in righteousness. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us his word and he gives us this. All the people in this room, God's community. You know what? You get a bunch of sinners together. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a sinner. Dirty, rotten sinner. (laughs) Whoa, we just went like... I always said, sinner, dirty, rotten sinner. (laughs) Wow. All right. Hey, cool. It's okay. It's cool. All right. We went to an 11 there. It's all right. Uh, That illustration went a little haywire. It's all right. Um, Yes. You guys are like about to start throwing chairs. It's like WWE back there hitting each other with holding chairs. Here's the thing. You get a bunch of sinners together that are insecure, afraid of failing. There's going to be conflict. But guess what? That's why we have the Holy Spirit and we have God's word. To as we process that conflict, guess what? We can lovingly say, okay, you hurt me. And in response, I hurt you. But our example is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's in you. The Holy Spirit's in me. And I'm going to trust that this word is true. And so I'm going to value you even though you hurt me. And that conflict, the healing that comes from that conflict makes us stronger. It brings us together. This is the important thing about the gospel is that it changes the way that people view each other. The defining characteristic of God is his love. That's agape love. Okay, that love looks for genuine healing through bringing people to Christ. But, but, but Peter, he hears all this about this is for God's glory. This is for all this. This is for good. You to love each other. And he's like, um, excuse me. He's that guy. Uh, actually, you know, he pushes his glasses up. Look at this. Look at this in 14. Oh, sorry. Sorry. The end of 13. Peter's denial. So he says, Lord, Simon Peter said, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you can't follow me, but you will follow me later. Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. He's saying, look at me, but you don't see how loyal I am. He's like, I, I, I'm, I'm worthy. You can tell me where you're going. I'll go with you right now. Like, I'll die for you. And Jesus is like, dude, you don't get it. You're not seeing this. This, this is going to happen. Okay, this is God's plan. And he's got a different role for you. He's got a different role for me. See, that's one of the things that we get, that we get wrapped around the axle. We start to think that, that somehow what God has told someone else to do is what we're supposed to do. And then if we're following Jesus and we're doing, we're doing big things, Satan loves to come behind us and say, oh, man, you're doing it right. You're do, man, you're chasing Jesus. This is awesome. You know what? If that person had your faith, they would be doing so much better. And then we begin to start pushing people away that have a different calling than we do. Jesus is making the point to Peter here that he's like, dude, we've got different roles to play here. I am going away. Come to terms with it. And Peter's like, but, 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 but. See, we think that we know better than God. He's like, why can't I come now? I should be able to come now. He's re- he says he's ready to go the distance. But here's the thing. Is that Peter hadn't failed yet. It could be for you. You're praying that God would use you. You're praying that God would, could, would inject himself into your life and show you supernatural things. But the truth is that you haven't failed enough yet because you still think that you're valuable. You still think that you're the one that God needs to save the world. God loves a humble heart. James, we learned in James earlier this year that God resists the proud. He sends the armies of heaven against the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. A humble heart is the heart that God can use. And so most of the time, at least in my experience, I'm so thick-headed that it takes failure for me to get, away, get out of my own way. Mm-hmm. And then God finally is like, okay, awesome. Now you're broken. Now I can use you. 
because God only works with humble people because he will not share the glory. Jesus tells Peter that he's going to deny him. Okay, so then he gets into this, this whole, uh, he encourages, them about, encourages him about the denial because he knows this breaks Peter's heart. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. He's telling him to trust him and to trust the Father. See, how we deal with the journey is by following Jesus, this process of failure. Look at, look at verses uh, one through seven. We're gonna read this again. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If I would not have told you, I, if not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Jesus is saying, this is just temporary. I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna make this right. Don't be discouraged. He says, I'm going to come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way where I'm going. So Jesus is telling him, listen, here's the process. It's really simple. So in John 15, the next chapter after this, we're not going to go into this tonight, but Jesus lays out a very simple recipe for success. Okay, are you ready for this? He says, if you stay connected to me, like I stay connected to the Father, I will take care of everything. The failure, the restoration, all of it. If you stay connected to me, the word is abide. He used the analogy of a grapevine. If you abide in me, all these other things will happen. You'll start to show things like love, real love to people. You'll have joy, real joy. You'll have peace, real peace. All of these things come from an abiding heart. Jesus is saying, this is how you deal with this separation. You follow me. This is why he has this discussion with Thomas. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas is so literal that he misses the point. Jesus told him, verse six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is saying there's no other hidden thing here. I'm telling you straight. This piece of scripture is how we know that Jesus is the only way that you will find true purpose in life as you live. Our world world is full of people who are making you promises. If you look this way, if you do these things, if you marry this person, if you follow this trajectory, if you if you're in this kind of a this kind of an environment, if you if you're part of this movement or that movement, or you do this thing, you're part of this group or that group, somehow you're going to be happy. That is not true. It is not true. There is no real love away, apart from Jesus. There is no real joy apart from Jesus. There's no there's no kindness. There's no faithfulness. There's no gentleness. There's no self control. Without Jesus, he is the only way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, this is how you deal with this. See, the first thing that a mature believer has to settle in their mind is that they will fail. Jesus is telling Peter, you're going to fail. It's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. These promises tell us that God has a job for us, and it has nothing to do with our perception of what success looks like. He has called us to wait here and to seek Jesus. We're not in the results business. We're in the the chasing Jesus, the abiding business. This is a profound truth. But I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, that's not good enough because I need to be able to contribute here. Why? Why do you have to contribute? What makes you so needy to be contributing to what God's doing? Because the Bible says that that's called pride. I want to feel valuable because I want to be able to determine what makes me valuable. But God's word doesn't say that. You're not, you're not valued by what you do. You're valid, valued by who you are. Psalm 139 teaches us that every single one of you was made on purpose for a purpose. That you were knit together in your mother's womb. Mm-hmm. The thing that's, that has been profound for me, I've been studying this this last week, is that not only does it mean that you were intimately created with your eyes and your hair, with your personality and your smile, with the joy that you bring to people, with your work ethic and the way that you carry yourself. 
Not only is that important, but he also says that your days were fashioned before any of them happened and they were written for me. What that means is that God takes an intimately created human being paired with an intimately created future every single day and they go together like two sides of DNA. That God has intimately made you. That is what makes you valuable. Things are valuable based on what people will pay for them. And what God paid for you was his own blood through Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm going away. I'm going on a trip, but I'm coming back. Peter says, no, I want to go with you. Why? Because I'm valuable. You gotta, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die for you. Like I'm all in. Jesus says, no. I've got my job. You've got your job. Don't think that you've got to do God's job. Because there's two things I know about the world. There's one God and I'm not him. And neither are you. Totally stole that from Rudy. It's a great movie. Anyway. So John 14, uh, 15 and 16. They, they, they detail uh, these last moments with Jesus and his disciples. And we're going to skip over those and we're going to move to, to, to chapter 18. Okay. So turn over to, to John chapter 18. So Jesus has told Peter, hey, you're going you're to deny me. You're going to fail. And so he has this long talk with his disciples. If you have, a, if you have time, I would inc- highly encourage you to read uh, Prover- or John uh, 15 through 17. The most incredible lessons in God's word. These are Jesus' parting thoughts to his disciples. Powerful. If you have time, read those in your, in your time with Jesus in the morning. So Jesus takes his disciples up to, the, up to the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he continues to struggle with this idea of leaving them as he prays. Okay, And, he, and then he gets arrested. Well, Peter is probably still thinking about what Jesus said back at dinner. I can just imagine him. Okay, so, so Jesus, they go into the garden. The rest of the disciples stay. Jesus asks Peter, James, and John, his three buddies, his three closest friends to come with him to pray. Right? And so they go to pray. It's late, they're tired, their bellies are full, and so they fall asleep. But Peter, he's so insecure, he's like, I'm going to show him. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to deny him, even though he's right about everything else that he says, like, this is not going to be true. How many times do we do that with God? He says, hey, this is coming, this is coming, just so you know. And like, nope, that's not going to happen. I'm going to will this to be different. You know what? Oh my gosh. He is such a great guy. He just doesn't know Jesus. I'll help him get there. No. Or, oh, she's so great. If only she knew Jesus. They, you know, we can make this work. Absolutely not. It doesn't work that way. Right? When, G, when God says something, it, he, it, it always happens. But Peter is so bent out of shape by this idea that he's just obsessed. Okay, so in, in, in John chapter 18, we're going to start in verse 15. So check this out. This is what happens next. So Simon Peter was following Jesus as another disciple. That disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A little bit more here. I forgot. There's so much here. I left this out. So Peter, more background here. I totally missed the part. Sorry, I'm getting excited. (laughs) So they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and... And so Judas and we know the story, Judas and and the high priest and all the soldiers come to arrest Jesus. So so Peter freaks out. He draws a sword. I don't know where he was hiding the sword. He cuts off this, he cuts off this dude's ear, the servant of the high priest. And Jesus is like, whoa, hold up. What are you doing? It's not his work. What are you doing? And so Peter's just like, oh, okay. That didn't go as I planned. And so Jesus is like, Dude, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Put that thing away. <laughs> right? So Jesus heals the guy. He heals the servant. So they take Jesus to arrest him. So Peter's like, oh my gosh, what just happened? Like, I just tried to defend him and he rebuked me. And then like, this was our moment. It was going to be great. I was going to sacrifice myself for him. It was going to be awesome. And he was going to know how much I was dedicated to him. Because he's not leaving without me. And Jesus is like, dude, don't. Just stop. <laughs> okay. Now, back to where we were here. So John 18, starting in verse 15. So they're following Jesus as he's arrested. They're following him to, we don't know where he's going. So Simon Peter, verse 15, Simon Peter was following Jesus as was another disciple. He's talking about John. John always refers to himself in the third person in in his gospel. So 
FYI. That disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest. So he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter remained standing outside by the door. So the other disciple, this is John, the one who knew the high priest, name drop, went out and spoke to the girl who was the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Okay, so Peter's like on the outside. John knows. He's got the inside scoop. So he, uh, he's like talking to the girl who's keeping the gates like, hey, can you let my buddy in? Like, he'll just stay right here. He's not going to go inside, but he's just going to hang here. Okay, so servant girl lets him in. Picking up. Uh, verse 17, the servant girl who was, at the, who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? He says, I'm not, he said. Now the servants and the officials had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing there warming themselves and Peter was standing with them, warming himself. Okay, let me pause right there. Okay, so Peter and John follow Jesus to the home of the high priest. So John goes inside because he knows this family, and he, and he, he convinces the, the girl to let him in, to let Peter in. So Peter's trying to listen to the conversation. Now, what's interesting is that the, the servant girl at the gate already knows that John is a follower of Jesus. Because she tells Peter, like, oh, are you his disciple too? So John's not even, like, trying to hide this. He just, like, walks in. But, he, but Peter is a little unsure of himself, and so he's like, oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just going to go over here and hang out by the fire, right? And so he stands there to the side and he just kind of, you know, I can just imagine him just, you know, he's craning his neck trying to listen to what's happening because there's some action going on over here with Jesus. Okay, so he's trying to do this, right? And he stands to the side and Jesus begins to be questioned, okay? So here's something that you have to remember, is that when God prepares something, he always makes the stakes incredibly high. And here's why I say that. He wants you, if you have made yourself the God of your life, he wants to put you in an extreme situation. Because God doesn't do anything halfway. Right? So there are, there are two things happening here. Jesus knows that this process of him being judged is going to be part of his crucifixion. He knows he's going to be beaten. He knows he's going to get whipped. He knows he's going to get crucified. So that's one thing that's happening here. Another thing is that Jesus is making a point in Peter's life. Even in this moment, Jesus is teaching Peter. So God, so Jesus has made this such an extreme thing, right? This is, this is, this is so big that it is, um, it is so significant. So check this out. So Peter's listening, verse 19. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus answered him. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews congregate. And I haven't spoken anything in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who heard and what, what I told them. Look, I know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officials standing by slapped Jesus saying, is this the way you answer to the high priest? And Jesus turned, he says, if I've spoken wrongly, give evidence about being wrong. But if, if rightly, why are you hitting me? Then Anna sent him, about, sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So think about this. Jesus, so Peter has already denied him once. He's standing by the gate, or standing by the gate by this fire, warming himself. He's trying to listen to see. And he, all he can hear are whispers. John's closer because he knows the family. So he, that's why he's written this account. But Peter is just standing there. He's listening. All he hears is mumbles. And you got this servant girl who keeps bothering him. And he looks over and he just sees Jesus get whacked by this guy. And so Peter is growing more and more upset more and more agitated. It's not supposed to be this way. It is not supposed to be this way. This is not the way that I've designed things. Jesus, if you just let me do it, I know, I know I can do this. If you'll just let me, turn me loose. So he begins to gin himself up. You know, trying to not, trying to not be too invested. He sees Jesus get slapped and he's like, oh my goodness, that's the Messiah. Why would he do that? Like Jesus, if you'll just like slaughter him, pull down some angels and just go to town. It's almost like he is, after he sees this happen, Peter's like, oh my gosh, what's happening? So he pretends like he's not that interested. So look at what happens next in verse 25. 
Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and they said to him, You aren't one of his disciples too, are you? And he denied it, and he said, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off, said, Didn't I see you with him in the garden? (laughs) I used to imagine this guy saying something like that, like, Bro, I saw you in the garden. Like, I know you're one of his guys. And Peter denied it again, and immediately the rooster crowed. In another account, um, it says that when this happened, I believe it's in Mark, that Jesus, you know, he just gets smacked by this guy. And then then Peter denies him the third time. Right before the rooster crows, it says that Jesus looks directly at Peter and they lock eyes. And I just, I I can just still imagine Jesus' face is still red from that slap. And he just looks over to the side. All this other stuff's going around Jesus, you know, so far away that Peter's just hearing the murmurs. And then all this stuff happens and Peter's like, no, I don't know him. And then all of a sudden he looks over and Jesus is, is not talking to the high priest anymore. He's not even, he doesn't even care about anything else that's going on. He looked straight at Peter's eyes. And he knew exactly what happened. And then the rooster crowed. Peter, you will deny me. You will fail me. Philip Jackson, you will fail me. You're going to hurt people. You're going to be a bad steward of my name. You're going to say things you shouldn't say. You're going to do things you shouldn't do. But praise be to God that we don't have to stay there. See, when God says something will happen, it means that it will. It's what the Bible calls a spiritual law. Just like there are laws in nature, like gravity, there are spiritual laws that always have the same result. One of those spiritual laws is that when God says something will happen, it will. See, here's what's important for us to remember, okay? Is that we have to accept that failure is a part of God's will because it keeps our eyes on him. As Peter experienced Jesus' prophecy come to fruition, he began to stop looking at himself and started looking at Jesus. See, the problem that we face in our fear of failing is that we are so obsessed with ourselves that we forget about Jesus. Because it's all about protecting my image. It's all about making sure that my Instagram profile is on point, that my posts are right, that my, the things that I say are wise, that people think that I'm smart. It's all about crafting this persona of myself. And it's not until finally God lets us wrap ourselves around the axle of life and we begin to get our spirits crushed that he can say, okay, now I can use you. Because if you are trusting in yourself, or Jeremiah tells us that the heart of man is desperately wicked and no one can know it. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing good. That means that if there's any element of you in control, guess what? It's going to be bad. So God does this out of his own protection for you. So he says, I've got to, I've got to start pulling that, that, that guy out, that old girl that just keeps, man, keeps making a mess. I'm going to let you fail because every time you fail, you come back to me. Because it gives me a chance to say I love you. Okay, so Jesus is led away. He's mocked and he's tried and he's beaten and crucified. Okay, the disciples, they hide in the upper room because they're terrified. John is the only one that is at the cross with Jesus. And Jesus gives him stewardship of his mother and the women in his life. Because remember, Jesus is the oldest son of his family. So since his father is dead, Jesus is the one who's responsible for all the women in his life. So Jesus passes that responsibility on to John. I think it's interesting because James and Jude, Jesus' brothers, aren't anywhere around That responsibility should have been passed to another son. But instead, Jesus gives it to John. I I believe that that's why John never actually died a martyr's death. Because he's the only one that didn't abandon Jesus. That's why he refers to him as the apostle that, or the disciple that Jesus loved. John was in it. Always. That's why Jesus gave him the revelation of the the end time. So Jesus is crucified. His disciples are hiding in the upper room and they find out that Jesus isn't dead anymore. So he appears to them in the upper room. We know the story. Jesus eats with them. He says, guys, I'm hungry. Can we eat, please? To prove to them that he is fully resurrected, a fully resurrected physical person. He says, I'm hungry. Let's eat something. Okay, so, so they have this fellowship with him. 
And he begins to teach them all the ways that, that, he has, that he has fulfilled what he said. But I can still imagine Peter. He's still hanging in the back. He's like, man, I was right there. I was his boy. It was me and Jesus. I walked on the water. Hey, my advice, do you remember when I walked on the water? Do you, were you, would you remember when I did that? I remember, Peter. You guys remember when I did this for him? Yeah, Peter, we remember. You remember when I did? Yes, Peter, we remember. It's like, I was so close. Screwed it up. (laughs) And he just kind of like, okay, I'm not qualified anymore. This whole celebration, Jesus comes and visits them, appears to them over 40 days. Peter just hangs back. His soul is crushed. He thought this was the one thing I could do. I could do this. I can, I can be the, the, right, the right hand of the Messiah. I can do that. I'll give my life for him. But he tried and he got rebuked. And he said, no, I'm going to stick with you. I'm not going to deny you. He did it three times and Jesus locked eyes with him. So Peter's spirit is crushed. Not only have I failed, but I have failed in the worst way possible. And when he died, I wasn't even there. But Jesus is too sweet. Turn over to chapter 21. The thing I love about the relationship between Peter and James and John and Jesus is that they're bookended by the exact same miracle. Their, their experiences with Jesus are bookended by the exact same miracle. If you, if you read the account of John and, and the other Gospels, John is the most comprehensive in, in both of these accounts. But um, it's, all, it's all about the fish in the net. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story real quick, not related to our text right here. So the first time that Peter, James, and John meet Jesus, they've been fishing all night in the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so Peter's brother, Andrew, has been following this guy called John the Baptist. And so a couple of days before they have their fishless night, Andrew is with John, and John's baptizing people in the Jordan River, okay, right outside Jerusalem. And in walks Jesus, John's cousin. And John says in front of the entire crowd, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew, I can imagine, in my sanctified imagination, is thinking, that's weird. (laughs) So he baptizes Jesus. Right? Again, he's off in the distance. He doesn't hear the little dialogue. He baptizes Jesus and he comes back up. Spirit of God descends on Jesus like a dove. And we hear a voice. Behold my son with whom I am well pleased. This is significant. A couple of days goes by. And there's Sea of Galilee. Andrew's been fishing with his brother and his cousins. They haven't caught anything. They're tired. But he sees his master up on the hill. Oh, there's John. I'm going to go say hi to John. So he goes over to see John. And he's standing there, and sure enough, this same dude starts walking through the crowd. Only he's got a little following now. Like People are starting to listen to him, and he's kind of gathered a little posse, right? And he hears John say under his breath, Behold, Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. Just a little acknowledgement of who Jesus is. And Andrew says, Okay. Peter needs to meet this guy. So he rushes down to the water. Peter's cleaning his nets with his cousins. And about that time, Jesus comes up and Andrew says, Peter or Simon, I want you to meet Jesus. Jesus, this is Simon. And they have this little exchange. He says, I'm not going to call you Simon. I'm going to call you Peter. Because on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And about that time, the crowd starts to push Jesus into the water. He's like, dude, my feet are getting wet. And so he turns to Peter and he says, hey, can I borrow your boat for a minute? So they get in the boat, they push off from the shore, and Jesus teaches, and his voice bounces off the water like a natural amphitheater. And after he's done teaching, he turns to Peter and he says, hey, while we're out here, I'll tell you what, let's go out in the deep water. Okay. So Peter, real exhausted, he's like, all right, cool. So Andrew and Peter, they row him out to the deep water. And Jesus is like, man, this is really nice. (laughs) Hey, you know what we should do? Let's throw a net in the water. 
And Peter's like, Rabbi, <laughs> we've been fishing all night. I mean, you may not, you're a carpenter. You probably don't know this, but you see, you catch fish at night when you're using a net because they can't see because it's dark. And Jesus is like, tell you what, why don't you just throw your net on the other side of the boat? And so we know the story. They throw the net on the other side of the boat, you know, humoring him. Next thing we know, that net fills full of fish so much that their ship starts to sink. And they scream to their cousins, James, John, get over here. So James and John come over and they get all the fish in the boat and, the fi- and, the, and both boats start to sink. At this point, Peter looks at Jesus and he's just like, what is happening? I just picture Jesus. Just met this dude. And he goes, hey, follow me. And I'll teach you how to catch men. Think about that picture. To a person who wants to feel significant. I'll teach you to connect, to catch people. Okay, I'm in. So fast forward three and a half years. Peter is defeated. He's failed. He is the most terrible failure in the history of the universe because he has failed the Messiah. Look at what happens. They're out fishing. They haven't caught anything. Wow, we've read this story before. Starting in verse 15. They go and they, they, uh, they do the same thing. They see a rabbi walking on the shore. They can't see his face, who he is. And he says, hey, guys, how was the fishing last night? It was terrible. Hey, why don't you try throwing the net on the other side of the boat? <laughs> I, it's just humorous to me. So I'm like, okay, right? So they throw the net in the water. And as soon as it, it fills with fish. And they didn't need to know who that was on the beach. They knew. They didn't have to ask his name. John turns to Peter and he's like, Peter, it's the Lord. What does Peter do? He like jumps in the water. He's like, I'm in. And they're talking with Jesus on the shore. Because Peter is seen. My master just said to do this thing. This is an inside joke with us. (laughs) He wants me to come to the shore and eat breakfast with him. What? They have breakfast. And then Jesus has this conversation with Peter. They're beginning to leave the campsite. And Peter is just on Jesus' heels, wanting to ask him questions. Look at verse 15. It says, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he had asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. Jesus asked him, he says, hey, do you love me? You see, even though God knows that we're going to fail, 
There's always a plan to restor- restoration, an expected restoration. We can always bank on that. God is a restoring God. He absolutely is a restoring God. So here's the thing. God expects you to fail. He expects you to fail. He knows that you are going to fall short. And He also knows that that prophecy of you failing is going to be confirmed in your life. You can, you can take that to the bank. I'm going to fail. But He always sends restoration. Because of his failure, Peter had a low view of himself. He was thinking still on this whole idea that, I, that somehow I bring something to the table, that I contribute something. And he's like, I can't do it anymore. I've screwed up so bad. God can't use me. Have you ever been there? I am just a dirty, rotten piece of garbage. And God can't use me. I have messed up. I have hurt people. I've hurt myself. I can't change anything that I've done. I've given away pieces of myself that I can't get back. And God must hate me for it. He can't use me. Peter had a low view of himself because he saw himself from his own eyes. He didn't see himself from Jesus' eyes. Jesus knew, him, knew the answer to the question. He asked him three times, do you love me? Because he was restoring him for the three times that he denied him. He asked him, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you have a godly love for me? And Peter says, oh no, I phileo you. I love you like a brother, like my family. And Jesus asked him the second time, Peter, son of John, do you agape me? Do you see me? Do you see yourself like God sees you? Oh yes, Lord, I phileo you. I love you like my family. And Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter finally breaking through says, yes, Lord, I agape you. See, in Greek, there are different words for love. In English, we only have one word, love. And agape love is a love that is a godly love. This is a love that builds people up, that will sacrifice for other people. See, a phileo love, a family love, is is a love by obligation. I'm contractually obligated to love someone because they're my family. Now, I can write them off, but I can't change their DNA. They're still my family, right? Let's be honest. Some of us have family that are a little messed up. (laughs) But there's a difference between phileo loving someone and agape loving someone. Jesus is saying, no, this is not about you being obligated to me because I'm your master, This is about you loving me because I love you first. Do you agape me? Do you see yourself when you talk to yourself in the mirror, in the quiet moments of your life, and you tell yourself that you're nothing but a dirty, rotten piece of garbage? Are you speaking the words that God would speak to you? Or are you saying that you are a new creature, created in Christ Jesus, destined for good things because God said so? Our failures don't define us. They're a tool that God uses. See, Jesus is making the point that what happened to Peter, what he did, did not change the way that he felt about him. God has one expectation for you, and that is that you are going to fail. But look at this. This is interesting to me. So the final, the final verses in, in John, uh, Peter turns around, and he looks at John, and he's a little insecure. He says, well, what about him? He's the rock star. He's the one that never failed. Look at what he says. Verse 20. So Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved, following them, the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and asked, Lord, who is the one that's going to betray you? Then Peter, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Because Peter's thinking in his mind, like, you, so you can't use me. You may love me, but you can't use me. That's not true. If you think that of your life, That God loves you, but he can't use you? That is not true. Not true. And Jesus says to him, verse 22, If I want him to remain until I come, Jesus answered, What's that to you? As for you, follow me. He said, Don't worry about your brother. You focus on me. 
See, the greatest challenge that we face as children of God, trapped in our sinful condition, is managing expectations. Expectations are the soil that, that everything grows in. I expect this from God, and when I don't get it, I get upset. Expectations are a big deal. What we expect will determine how we see ourselves and how we see God. What Peter experienced was the roller coaster of expectations. He expected to be a solid servant of Jesus, but instead Jesus gently taught him about failure. God has expected has one expect, expectation of you while you're separate from him that you're going to fail. The question is not if, it's when. So I want you to think about this. What are you expecting from yourself that causes you to be afraid that you're going to fail? What are you expecting? Are you expecting to be rock solid? Are you expecting to never make a mistake? Are you expecting to be the super Christian that, that, nobody, that never has to say I'm sorry to people? Mm-hmm. Or do you see yourself like God sees you? Give yourself grace and know that you're going to screw up. You're going to fail. You're going to make people miserable and you're going to have to make it right. And understand that that doesn't change how God sees you. This is a big deal. Everybody in our culture is looking for something of value. And they don't realize that they, need, they think that something external has to validate them. But that's not true. God is the one that validates us. God is the one that values us. God is the one that does everything in us. Like we have nothing to offer. And it's the, the moment that we think that we have to is the moment we're going to fail. If you put all, the, all of your faith in yourself and the world comes crashing down, guess who gets the blame? You do. How do you look at your failure? Is it a method for growth or destruction? This is how we see God. So we see, we see ourselves and we begin to, to elevate ourselves to a point of, of magnitude. We make ourselves the idol and things come crashing down. But do we see God properly that, that whenever we fail that he's going to give us grace? That he loves us? That he agapes us? And do we agape him back? Or do we phileo him back? Do we follow him out of obligation because he saved us? Oh, well, he paid for my sin, so I guess I better do what he tells me to do. Or do we genuinely want to sacrifice ourselves so that we can be closer to him? Why are you afraid? I want you to walk away with these four truths. Number one, God loves you. He doesn't just phileo you. He agapes you. God loves you. So much so that he would sacrifice himself to make it right. When he wasn't obligated to. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Second thing is that God has said you will fail. You will fail. Repeat after me. I will fail. I will fail. But God loves me. Third thing, God expects you to fail. Not only has he said you'll fail, but he expects you to fail. Guess what? You're not the smartest person on the planet, and neither am I. So you're going to make mistakes. Fourth thing, this is a promise you need to hold on to. God will restore you after you fail. God will restore you. I want you to think about this as you go here from here tonight. The words that Jesus told Peter when he told him he was going to fail. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it. In other words, your heart's default is to be troubled, is to be afraid. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. We have to get up in the morning. We've got to tell ourselves, I am a child of God. And I'm going to give myself grace today. I don't want you to think that you have to live a perfect life, that you have to have the perfect job, that you've got to get the right career, the perfect. Don't screw up your your degree program because, my goodness, God can't use you if you've got the wrong bachelor's degree. I'll tell you that. All of that is garbage. It's lies from the enemy. Don't let your hearts be troubled. 
Don't be afraid to fail. Because it's the failing that makes it good. God intends for you to be different tomorrow than you were today. And that, inc- that means that you have to go through failure. Mm-hmm. Trust me. I learned more from failure than I have from success. Mm-hmm. And I will take it all day long. Because God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. What's up, everybody? This is Philip Jackson, pastor of young adults at Evergreen Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday evening at 6.30 at Evergreen Church, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. For more information, check out our website, reachtulsa.org. You can connect with us on social media and on Instagram by searching for reach.tulsa. Also, be sure to subscribe to our content for the latest sermons and updates. You can also find us on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Yeah, watch over us. Bring your glory to